had all sorts of videos planned to record tonight, but I just finished recording a review to a documentary that was just so thought-provoking and mind-exploding that I wore myself out just talking about it because it's like my mind just got bleh. So I decided that instead of all these other things I was planning to watch, I would settle on something that I felt like I was kind of more in the mood for at this particular moment. Hopefully tomorrow I can get, well, no, I don't know. Tomorrow I'm going to go see Scream as of the recording of this. And then when I get home, I'll have a review to film. And then during the day, of course, I've got work. So I don't know how much I'll be able to film tomorrow. But this one looked interesting to me. It's called The Com Most Common Mistakes I Still Make in Spanish. I can't remember the name of this guy's channel, but this video isn't very long. And I was drawn to it because... You know, I'm interested in things regarding the Spanish language. So let's just go ahead and see what he says. I'm curious to find out if what he struggles with is something that I also continue to struggle with. Or maybe not. Okay, let's see what he has to say. Hey everybody, Kiru Paul here. Welcome to the channel. You know, I've spoken Spanish in one capacity or another for like 30 years now. Uh, I originally learned it on my own being a law enforcement officer in Florida. I did thousands of work-related translations over a 25-year career and had to testify to those translations. Oh, wow. I married a woman from Colombia. We spoke both languages at home. I did public speaking in Spanish, uh, different events, including events for the Mexican consulate out of Orlando. I lived full-time in a Spanish-speaking country for six years. Let's just say wow. I've had a lot of exposure He's fluent. to Spanish. <laughs> I'm but sure there are he is. certain common mistakes that, well, I still make to this day. And in this video, I'm going to cover those. So hopefully you don't make those mistakes. I'm and sure maybe I <laughs> I'll stop doing those things if I'm more aware of it. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> maybe not. If you like videos like this one, do me a favor and go ahead and hit the like button now. That way you won't forget later. All right, let's get started. By far, the number one most common the mistake gender. I make in Spanish is, should really include a drum roll here, don't you think? Is... I include the subject or the pronoun for the subject too often in oh, my Spanish. Some of you yeah. may be like, I have no idea what that means, Paul. Yeah. Well, in English, we always have to include the subject. Like, I want, yeah, you I would, want, I want, she yeah, wants, I knew that I use, use that she. word, that example and that's because, specifically. Well, our verbs really don't conjugate. So you couldn't right. just use the verb. Want, who wants? I don't know. Well, in Spanish, because of the verb conjugations, it does make it easier to figure out who's speaking and if it is known through the verb conjugation or through context, mm -hmm. then the most common and native thing to do is to drop the subject altogether. Right. For example, if I wanted to say something like, I want you to do it, I wouldn't say, yo quiero que tú lo hagas. I would just say, quiero que, que lo quiero hagas. hagas. Now, mm -hmm. I don't put these subjects in all the time. Yeah, so that... Okay, I don't have a problem with that personally, because I understood early on that that was not something that was generally done. And in fact, if you do it too much, especially if, especially if you use uh, yo all the time, yo quiero, yo hablo, yo como, yo whatever, whatever, yo, 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 if you do that too much, you come across as like a little bit, I don't know egotistical maybe, or, you know, it's all about you, you, you. In fact, there was, there's this funny little, I'm going to show it to you. I'll try to put it up on the screen too. It's this funny little cartoon, this little comic that was in my college Spanish, Spanish book. And I think the name of the cartoon character here, or the comic character is Matilde. I'm not sure, but she's talking to her friend Felipe. And she says, que demonios es eso, Felipe? And he's got this yo-yo, see? It says un yo-yo. And she says, un vos, vos? And he says, vos is another word for like, um, like vos, vosotros, my, like, it's a, they use it mostly in Spain, maybe sometimes in Argentina, maybe in Argentina too, but in Spain, it's just another way to say like, um, tu, but a group of people, or, yeah, that's generally the way I understood it. But anyway, and he says, no, un yo-yo. She says, ah, un Philippe Philippe. <laughs> she thinks he's talking about himself, obviously. And she says, no. He says, no. No es yo de yo. Se llama yo-yo. Entiendes? Yo-yo, yo-yo. 
And so she says, egocentrico. <laughs> she thinks he's, she still thinks he's talking only about himself. Anyway, so that's never been an issue for me, really, because for some reason, that was just something that I grasped pretty easily early on. I thought he was going to say the gender matching. Oh my gosh, that just blows my mind. I still, I constantly have trouble with that. But I do use them more often than native speakers do. And it's something that um, some native speakers like to call me out on, on some of my lessons, mm. especially one individual from Valencia, Spain named Robert. He really likes to call me out on that. So after 30 years, why am I still doing that? Well, a lot of it has to do with my former job. I translated during police investigations. Oh, and these translations great. would be analyzed by defense attorneys looking mm. for problems and go to court, mm. things like that. So you had to be real and clear. And the subject could get you in trouble. For example, let's right. say I'm, we're investigating a shooting and we're talking about a couple sentences back, somebody named Juan, you know, is involved. And the person you're interviewing on the recording says something like, Llegó a la casa y le disparó. Now, if you were just talking about Juan, then you would take it to mean he arrived at the house and he shot someone. Mm -hmm. Now, that would be obviously the victim we're talking about. Now, there's a lot of back context in that sentence. But when you go to court or even a deposition, what the defense attorneys will do, and these tend to be native Spanish speakers, is they'll take that sentence completely by itself. Uh, who arrived? Who shot him? Well, right. It's clear yeah. from the context, Juan shot him. Yeah, we don't see it that way. So the habit yeah. developed to keep saying subjects repeatedly, keep saying subjects, almost to the point it didn't sound native. But again, these translations could stand up to court without any problem. So I've carried that with me. I know I'm trying to lose it. I'm trying to get better at it. The second most common error that I make is that I still will use a personal pronoun every now and then when I really shouldn't, when it wouldn't be prudent to do so in Spanish. For example, um, in English, I would say, I put on my shirt. In Spanish, it would be, I put on the shirt. Me yeah, okay, okay, camisa. okay. I, at first, I didn't know what he was talking about. I thought he was, because I was like, well, that kind of still ties into the first one. But I know exactly what he's talking about. I do this all the time. Because my English, my English speaking brain is, is at play still when I speak because I'm, I'm still trying to speak in English patterns and that's so like in Spanish, they don't say I put on my shirt. We say that in English, but in Spanish, it's just the shirt. And to me, that makes no sense because of course that's, you know, I'm an English speaker. That makes no sense. Just like I, it makes no sense to me that there are things that are gendered. I get that that's part of it. I get it. I'm not like one of those people that, you know, attack the gender foundation of the romance languages or whatever, which I think is ridiculous. And they're even attempting to try to make it more gender, which is just stop, stop. If a language is going to change, it's going to do so naturally, not because you've got these little ideas in your head about the way things should be. But uh, I still struggle with basic stuff like that. I get it. I understand it. I know I'm doing it wrong, but it's just still not instinctive. And I have been speaking Spanish for a long time, not consistently, but I've been speaking Spanish long enough to know better, but still it's not ingrained enough in me. So I get completely what he's talking about. Or me pongo una camisa, or I put on a shirt, but not I put on my shirt mm -hmm. because who else's shirt would it be? Now, if I'm putting on someone else's shirt, then yeah, I need to be a bit more specific. Me pongo tu camisa. I put on your shirt. But in English, again, we use personal pronouns. Well, that happens a lot in Spanish. It also happens like with body parts. In Spanish, mm -hmm. um, people are often going to say the hand when they're talking about their own hand, hand, unless it's not clear whose hand it is. Well, occasionally, you know, instead of la mano, I might throw in a mi mano. Yeah. It will slip out of me. Yeah. I'd say the third most common mistake that I make is that I'll occasionally throw in uh, a the in Spanish where it may not be there because I'm getting it from my English because it sounds right because, well, English is my you know, first language. Yeah. For example, I think I did it the other day. I was talking about a verb in the subjunctive. And so I said, um, el verbo está en el subjuntivo. The verb is in the subjunctive, which thinking back, it should have been el verbo está en subjuntivo. Now, some of the things that um, English speakers who are learning Spanish tend to have trouble with, like verb conjugations or deciding between the indicative and the subjunctive. Oh, yeah, 
I don't have any trouble with that. I'm very comfortable with that. And that's why a lot of my lessons... I'm not. Subjunctive blows my brain all to pieces. I have so much trouble with subjunctive because when I think I understand it, there's always these other examples where, no, it's not subjunctive here. You don't have to use it. And I'm like, why? You're talking about words that should indicate subjunctive. I just, I don't know if I'll ever get my brain wrapped up around that. I will probably always be a B1 level, A2, B1, possibly B2 level speaker. I don't know that my brain's ever going to graduate up to C1 or C2. I just don't. I'm beyond A2, honestly. I, I'm, I'm in the B area, kind of a mixture between B1 and B2. But um, yeah, this is stuff that I still, I continually struggle with. Now, and when I'm reading it, I get it. And sometimes when I write it, I can do it correctly. But to just think it right, you know, in that moment, no, it does not come naturally to me at all. Lean towards um, helping English speakers understand those areas of the Spanish language. So let's go back to those three errors I make all the time. If I stop the video right now, some people are going to be like, you're making those errors, Paul, because you're translating literally from your English into Spanish. You yeah. need to think in Spanish. So I'll just talk about that now. And that's actually a pretty common question that I get from students mm -hmm. is that, are you translating in your head still or are you thinking in Spanish? So the answer is not a simple yes or no, I, I think in Spanish. When I hear Spanish, I don't have to translate it into my language. I mm -hmm. understand it without doing that. Mm. When I speak Spanish, I am also not translating it from my English. I'm just speaking it. Now, when I think to myself, my internal voice still speaks English to me. But mm. now when I'm speaking Spanish, then yes, the entire dialogue is in Spanish without any need to translate into my English. But English is still my first language. It is my paradigm of what language should be. Mm -hmm. Those different sentence structures and patterns and things are still going to have some influence over my Spanish, yeah. obviously, because I'm still having these issues all of these years later. Well, I hope you found the video useful, mm -hmm. and I hope you will learn something from my mistakes. And I will try not to repeat these mistakes in some of my future lessons. But if you see them pop up, well, you're going to know where they came from. <laughs> All right. Yes. Have a great day. And until next time, hasta luego. Hasta luego. Okay. So well, that was interesting. I, I enjoyed that. I think I'm going to have to sub to his channel and check out his, his videos. I, I am sub to so many Spanish language channels. And it, it's, it's frustrating because I can understand it a lot of times, but then at the same time, a lot of times I can't. Spanish is the second fastest language in the world, and it, consequently, it can be extremely difficult to understand a Spanish speaker if they don't slow down, for me anyway. That's the case. I can watch movies and get the basic gist, but I will miss a lot of what's what they're really saying because... Well, there are some movies where it's pretty easy to understand. It's pretty clear. But that's generally if they're they're more um, they enunciate very well the stuff that you know what they're saying if they're not smushing the words together which everybody does that and you know this is this is stuff I focus on for my job because we all talk that way when we're talking in our native language we smush words together we get real lazy about how we enunciate it just and yet. The people around us, for the most part, can understand exactly what we're saying. They get it. They know it because they speak it too. This is just normal. But in things like, let's say, audiobooks, I'm super hard on our voice actors when they do that. Like, I'm, I am so anal. It's not even funny. And it frustrates me because when I hear something like that, the smooshing together of the words, and I'm like, look, I get what you're saying, but... For audiobooks, maybe some people would have a harder time being able to to get it. Maybe it would bother them if if you're if it's not enunciated clearly enough. So the same thing happens in movies because I'm not a native speaker. When they talk full on, I can't always grasp. I can get words. Sometimes when they slow down, they have like short sentences. I can get it. But having the subtitles on in Spanish helps me tremendously because then I can at least catch glimpses of the words they're saying and I can understand much more what's going on.
so anyway, I don't know why I went on that tangent. When did I start talking? <laughs> I think I was saying <laughs> that this was really interesting. I, I did think that he was going to talk about gender stuff because that's still an issue having to match the genders. Oh my gosh. That, and then, then you have some words where you think that it, it should be masculine or, you know, based on, so like most masculine words have an O at the end, the most feminine words have an A at the end, but not necessarily for all of them. Like the word for hand is mano, but it, mano is feminine, not masculine. So you say la mano, not el mano, you know, stuff like that. And also things like reflexive pronouns. I feel like that's used a whole lot in Spanish and in English makes no sense to me. And there's other stuff that makes, that just blows my mind. Like I, I just, I'm constantly, I'm complaining about it, but not in the sense that, uh, well, okay. My son complains about it a lot because he, he, he's frustrated that he can't speak it fluently because my husband had stopped speaking Spanish to him when he was a young child because he had um, he had delayed speech and my husband was afraid well he's never going to learn English so I should speak English to him and we found out later that my son's dyslexic and that's probably why he had delayed speech because this happens a lot with dyslexics consequently my son now has to study it He's frustrated because it's not something that comes intuitively to him, and it should. And that's a real shame that that wasn't given to him. But I get on his case because he complains a lot of times about, well, this doesn't make any sense, and I'm doing the same thing. But at the, even though I'm complaining, I get it. I know that's just the way it is, and I just need to try to understand it more. And I think I'm, I think it's because I'm more frustrated with myself that it hasn't sunk in the way it really should. Part of that is just because of the fact that I don't speak it enough. I don't immerse myself in it enough. I mean, I am around it all the time. My husband always has Spanish language, you know, mostly soccer stuff playing, uh, <laughs> things like that. So I'm real familiar with some of the soccer commentators, David Feidelson, one of them that's always on TV, but I'm not completely like when we went down to Mexico long long time ago when my son was a bit tiny baby it we were there for about a week it wore me out it was so exhausting to have to speak only in Spanish except for you know if I spoke English with my husband or whatever but midway through by the end of the week it was very comfortable or much more comfortable than it was in the beginning so I do know that if it's something that I immerse myself in most of the time it will come more naturally to me these things that I struggle with but I guess I just kind of wish it would just happen by osmosis or whatever but whatever okay well that was a tangent this was a, an interesting video and I'm definitely going to check out more of his stuff um so I, I don't know I just felt like it'd be kind of cool to check it out so and that's what I was in the mood for and now I'm going to log off for the evening and we'll see you guys later. Bye.